Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Navy League's annual Sea Airspace Conference and Trade Show, the number one gathering of U.S. Navy leaders uh, as well as their international counterparts to talk about strategy, technology, budgets, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by GE Marine, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. And it's uh, our honor to talk to the nation's maritime administrator, uh, retired United States Navy uh, Rear Admiral Mark uh, Busby. Uh, sir, uh, thanks very much for making time Good for Vago. us. Good Just to be with you. Uh, it's a it's an absolute uh, pleasure. Um, talk to us a little bit about the Maritime Administration, because at the end of the day, folks have a tendency of focusing on the other aspects of sea power, not recognizing that actually the, the nation, you know, you guys play such a key role both in the nation's commercial maritime trade, but also preparedness and sea lift capability. Talk to us about the role of the organization in a great power context. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, uh, Vago, for, uh, for asking and for being with you. Uh, it's key. It's absolutely key. You know, sea power... Uh, as Mahan has told us, is not just navies, it's the commercial merchant marine as well. Uh, both parts of it uh, are necessary for a nation to be a great sea power. And I think we still fancy ourselves a great sea power, so you know, we've p potentially over the last few years gotten a little bit out of balance. We still have the greatest navy in the world, but our commercial merchant marine, that part of it has, has kind of uh, gone fallow a bit. Uh, you know, we're down to 81 U.S. internationally trading ships in this world. Uh, which is what, uh, what, what our commerce supports right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, we need to do better than that. Uh, our presence in the world suffers as a result of having so few ships. Um, and let's talk a little bit about that, because when you look at 81 ships, I mean, that's less than a month's work of, worth of losses we had in World War II, for example. And in any confrontation, whether it was China or Russia, we can expect to lose ships. Uh, and in fact, some of our adversaries know it may be better actually to sink all the oilers and sink all the cargo in the replenishment ships than it is necessarily to take the carriers out. Talk to us about what kind of national investment strategy we need to rebuild the nation's sea lift capacity, because obviously anywhere we go depends on these ships to get there. Right. So to have a merchant marine that's available in time of war, they need to be around in time of peace. They have to exist. Well, it's a commercial endeavor. Uh, you know, commercial shipping has to have cargo to carry. They have to have commerce to conduct. Uh, so having our ships, U.S. ships, uh, having access to cargoes that they can compete for economically uh, and, and carry around the world is critical. Part of the problem we have right now is that uh, many of the other countries of the, of the world, and I'm saying China primarily and, and some others, heavily underwrite their merchant marines, their shipping industries, both the shipbuilding and the actual operations. So they can charge rates far below what a U.S. company uh, has to charge just to, to make ends meet. So until that playing field gets more even, we're going to be at a disadvantage. U.S. fleets aren't going to be able to grow uh, in any great extent unless they have access to cargo uh, in order to do, be able to do business in peacetime so that we can call upon them in time of war. So it all comes back to figuring out how do we get a more level playing field. Um, you know, I, I mean this nonpartisanly, right, but um, I think it was the Reagan administration that reduced those subsidies that the maritime industry used to rely on, and that led to a decline both in the size of the merchant fleet but also in the amount of shipbuilding and the cost structure. And I understand the reasons for that, that other nations subsidize it and let's all try to get to an unsubsidized world, but that's not how it works almost in anything that deals with the word shipping. What's the right national strategic plan to create to resuscitate this, whether it's investment and underwriting of ship construction, obviously the Jones Act to a degree helps on that in that field, hurts in others depending on how you want to look at it. But all, you know, what is the kind of investment strategy we need? Because actually you can get considerable payoff for actually not a lot of national investment at the end of the day. Right. So you, know, you can gain, I think, a lot of what we want to try and gain uh, through trade negotiations, uh, through a more equitable sharing of the cargoes that are out there uh, to, to move. I mean, when you look now, we are a net energy exporter in this country, petroleum. Uh, so we have lots of liquefied natural gas, lots of petroleum. Uh, you know, very little of that right now is traveling on a U.S. flag ship. Um, much more of it could. You know, that would bring in a lot more U.S. flag tankers in, in that case. And, uh, you know, based on uh, if there was, if it was a negotiated uh, agreements with certain company, certain countries uh, to, uh, you know, balance the amount that would go on each. Uh, you know, that's been done in the past before. Uh, so it could be, could potentially be done again. Uh, 
you know, again, leveling that playing field, figuring out a way that uh, we could negate the investments that other countries are making in their merchant marines. They have made decisions that it's in t to their benefit to have uh, a large fleet and to make investments that way. Uh, you know, our policy has not been to do that. With certain exceptions, we have the Maritime Security Program, which keeps 60 U.S. flagships, 60 of those 81, uh, receive a $5 million per year stipend to be available uh, to stay under U.S. flag. The difference right now between a U.S. flagship and, a, and the same foreign flagship is about $6.7 million. That's how uneven the playing field has gotten. What we can do to close that gap into something that's reasonable uh, that's what we got to continue to focus on. Now, do you think that there also needs to be sort of a national um, level investment in um, shipbuilding capability? Because too often we've relied on our uh, military shipyards to be the commercial shipbuilders, and in some cases the economics of the of the commercial manufacturer isn't isn't there. And if you look at some of our competitors, they have made sustained, continuous investment to be able to be much higher velocity shipbuilders, whether they're Finns or South Koreans, uh, Japanese, obviously China in that market, but obviously other countries in the world playing, playing as well. Do we need to actually sort of set a marker down and say, hey, look, we're going to make this investment to allow our shipyards to actually close that gap by becoming much, much more sophisticated in how we build and design ships to be able to close perhaps that cost gap and actually become attractive for operators. Yeah, that certainly is, uh, is something that needs to be uh, looked at and addressed. You know, the, sh the U.S. shipyards that we have today that are operating around the country, uh, be they the few upper tier ones which are doing primarily military construction, military and Coast Guard, uh, you know, below that, it's all Jones Act work. It's all domestic. Uh, if, if it was not for the Jones Act, those yards would not be in business because, you know, it's, the, the, again, the cost differential by building a ship in the United States with our labor rates, our safety, everything else that, uh, you know, puts uh, cost into operating the United States, uh, it, you know, is way out of line with what uh, the costs are uh, internationally. And again, you have, you see countries that are making substantial uh, investments, underwriting, if you will, uh, those industries. Uh, with with the desire to have a strong, uh, you know, shipbuilding base from which they can take orders around the world and and, and, and capitalize on that, and, and China is really going after that. I mean, the Koreans and the Chinese and the Japanese used to be the big shipbuilders. Well, the Japanese are are kind of getting a way third. The, the Koreans are rapidly falling to second, and the Chinese are uh, are really going to town in terms of ship construction. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember at a time when even the Danes were highly competitive, but then Odense and Maersk uh, got out of that business building in... Uh, in I mean, uh, even in, in, in cruise ships, you know, where, right. uh, again, Germany and, and Italy have been the real, the real world leaders. Uh, Chinese are all in their yards right now learning their techniques, and very soon you're going to see Chinese cruise ships being built, and in a few more years the European market's going to go away or be extremely reduced. Uh, so if you were going to put a number on it, right, how much money do you think the nation, uh, the nation, nation's maritime, right, your capacity, is it 100, 200 million? Do we need to sustain sort of, hey, look, you know, we spend a billion dollars here and there. I don't want to sound like, you know, a billion dollars here and there. It's finally real money. But what's the kind of sustained investment we need? You know, sometimes you talk to Navy leaders and they say, you know, sailor training, if we just traded two jets a year, we could increase the amount of uh, resources available to train our sailors to make sure we yield better sailors. Right. Like in the grand scheme, that would seem a small trade-off. Do we need to actually look at this a little differently and say, hey, we spent $750 billion at the Pentagon hey, if we gave a billion of that to the Maritime Administration, this is the kind of net payoff we would have at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I, I'd hesitate to put a, an actual number on it, other, other than to say, to go back to my earlier statement, we have to have a balanced national fleet. And, you know, people have used that term on a couple of occasions, national fleet. What's that really mean? That, that means that balance that Mahan was talking about, having, you know, a good, strong Navy and Coast Guard, but also having that commercial side that, that fulfills the nation's... Uh, needs. Uh, you know, the Merchant Marine provides presence around the world also. You know, a, a ship with a U.S. flag flying off the stern uh, in, a, in a port uh, sends a signal as well. Uh, 81 ships doesn't send many signals. You know, they're not in a whole lot of ports. Uh, so having that balanced fleet and, and, and what the right number is, I, I couldn't probably tell you exactly what the right number is, more than it is now. Right. Uh, and, and then, of course, you get into, uh, you know, how much of that should be commercial investment, private investment, how should it, much of it should be 
national investment. Uh, you know, that's that's a debate that has to occur. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to preside over a lot, much larger merchant marine and a fleet that has more uh, footing around the world and that can better support our military forces. Right now, we're probably on the ragged edge of being able to really support our forces should we get into a full-blown sea lift. Well, so let me uh, let me ask you this, and I should also point out that uh, you're a Merchant Marine uh, Academy uh, graduate, I am. Uh, and uh, and uh, obviously folks graduate from the, all the Merchant Marine Academies and and uh, can go into the United States Navy. And you put the Navy blue uniform on when you were at Admiral uh, Farragut at 14, so you're somebody who's got a grounding in this. Um, how you know the, the Navy, for example, talks about 355 ships. Has there been an assessment, and do we know what's the number that the United States needs on your end of the equation to get the most out of that 355 ships? For example, do you need 120? Do you need 140? And do you have enough bodies to man the ships, for example? Because I know that it's a career field that is has also been under pressure and shrinking. Right, so of large ocean-going vessels uh, in our sort of national fleet, we have uh, the 81 that are internationally trading, in the Jones Act, we have 99 large ships. Uh, so, you know, commercially we have about 180. We think we need about another 50 or 60 flying under the U.S. flag just to provide enough employment base for the manning we required to man up the government-owned ships, the 46 that I run plus the 15 that MSC runs, uh, in order to have enough mariners to do that mission. So. 50 is the bottom line number we need. Uh, you, you can also look and say, uh, we also need about 86 tankers or so uh, to fulfill requirements should we get into a major sea lift, for instance, in the Pacific. Uh, that's probably a good number to use in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of petroleum that's going to need to flow to sustain our forces, both our afloat forces and our ashore forces. So we're talking a lot of ships. Sounds like a lot, a whole lot. But, you know, we, those could be made up pretty quickly. Uh, again, you know, as we were talking, we're a net energy exporter now. There's, there are thousands of tankers in, the, in this world, many of them U.S. owned already, but flying foreign flags that under the right set of circumstances, the right economic incentives could be brought back under the U.S. flag and sail for us and provide employment opportunities to make up for that about 1,800 man shortage that I'm looking at right now. We're about 1,800 short to do a sustained sea lift operation, more than about six months, to man up all of our commercial ships, plus the Ready Reserve Force, uh, the government-owned ships. And, and how many uh, mariners uh, do you have uh, now? So you're 1,800 short, yeah, how we, many? Yeah. We have uh, right around, we did a, a survey, we have right around 1,280, uh, I'm sorry, 12,800 or so mariners. We think we need uh, about another 1,800 to do a sustained sort of operation. Uh, and these are people that are, you know, are fully ocean qualified, uh, that are up to date, have all their medical, that are sailing regularly, we can count on. I think we're right around 1,200, uh, 12,800 or so. So if I look at the ship count, it's about 130 ships you need, if I'm counting that right, right? Between the 86 tankers additional that you, you know. Uh, well, uh, some of the, that 86 will come out of the, the 50 more uh, okay. that we need. Okay. But, you know, we're, we're saying, you know, if all 50 of those could be tankers, that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, in terms of just raw numbers of, sh of ships to provide the minimum number of people, it's right. about 50 more ships. Uh, and and um, but so the more the merrier. The, the more the merrier. And so if you could put a window on it, do you know, a 10-year plan would probably be a good thing, wouldn't it, to say, hey, look, yeah. let's try to build five ships a year or something like that to try to bridge build that gap? Or bring them in. Uh, you know, the, there is no requirement in the international trading fleet that they be U.S. built. It's only the Jones Act requires a U.S. build requirement. It would be obviously great for industry, American industry, to have them built in the United States. And a certain number of them certainly will under the Navy's plan. Uh, some of them will be U.S. built. But, uh, you know, absent uh, some sort of uh, program or funding to help those shipyards be uh, uh, more competitive in terms of building a ship as opposed to building it far, and that, that part needs to be addressed too. Uh, uh, sir, thanks for much. Retired uh, United States Navy Rear Admiral Mark Busby, who is the nation's maritime uh, administrator. Sir, it was an absolute pleasure, yeah, and, and 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 uh, I, I hope uh, hope folks are listening to this and actually put the kind of investment uh, we need because you guys do constitute a critical national capability. So thanks for all you do. Thanks for putting the light on it. We really appreciate it. It's an honor, sir. Bye bye.